Hello and welcome to the third episode of Design Education Talks, the collaboration between the team here of the New Art School and the Design Deducts podcast. Today, our special guest is Michael Johnson. Hello, Michael, Hi. and welcome to our podcast. Hello. Hello, everyone. Great everyone who's listening, watching, whatever. Great to have you. Tell us about you and your work. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, me. Um, I, uh, I run a design company here in London called Johnson Banks. It started 28 years ago. Uh, before that, I had uh, eight jobs in eight years. I was fired three times. Uh, always planned that I would set up a company by the age of 30. And by the t I think by the age of 28, I was unemployable. <laughs> so, so I just had to start. Um, and here I am, 20 years, eight years later. Um, Johnson Banks is a relatively small company. Um, we specialize in branding. We, we, now we specialize in, in for good. We do projects that make a difference. We try to move the needle on good projects. Um, and uh, there's never more than about 10 people. And we have clients all over the world. Fantastic. So it's, it's a huge journey. And uh, this, this idea about becoming unemployable. Is, yeah. uh, is, is, is something that uh, all designers eventually, eventually, eventually for face. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe, yes. Uh, I, I think in my case, I, I, I thought that I, I took the view that I should learn how to learn from other people's mistakes, but I still do think it's a very good way to learn how to become a designer. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so those working for other people was, it's good to, to work out what, what to do wrong, what to do wrong as, as well as what to do right. Um, but I, I, I did, uh, I wasn't a very good employee, you know. Yeah. I, I I started one job where I I had a whole team of people, and within a month they'd all left, you know, because I did all the work. Um, <laughs> uh, and I was that's just the way I was, really. I just worked all the time and concentrated very hard on what I did throughout my entire twenties. Really. Um, but do we uh, ever learn from from getting it right? <laughs> Did I learn from anyone getting it right? Not really. Um, as, as some people, no, no, I'm, it's, that's unfair. Some of the people I worked with, uh, they were very master craftsmen. I learned a lot from what they did. But uh, most of the time, um, I've been learning kind of on the job, really, for, as, as John Banks, uh, for three decades, basically. Yeah. So, so what, what made you get into teaching? Um, teaching? Uh, okay, well, I started... Uh, at the beginning of the 90s, when I started to have to start to look for designers mm. for, my, for, for the, company, the last company I worked for, and then when I started my own company, um, I started going to the good design colleges and looking around. And bit by bit, I started to get involved. I would start talking to the tutors. I would get involved. And I would, um, I unconsciously, really, I was forming links between myself and the good design colleges in London and around London. And getting to know the tutors, partly because I was trying to find good students uh, and good future employees. But I actually caught myself thinking that this is quite interesting and, and they then started to ask me if I wanted to come in and set a project and, and, and it started a snowball from there. And really for, throughout the 90s, I spent quite a lot of time really lecturing at lots of different kind of design colleges, setting briefs, going back and crits and those kind of things. Not, never anything regular in the 90s, but generally kind of dropping in and dropping out and, mm. uh, and running workshops and running seminars and working then in that way. So you've been through this whole uh, uh, pro sort of, uh, change of art schools in mm. the UK in the, in, in the past. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, they had smaller... Yeah, yeah. So when I, Kings, Kingston, one of my favorite design schools, my, still is. My, my, yes. Yeah, I mean, a great school. Uh, and I think when I started working with them, there were 30 or 40 people in the class. Now there's regularly over 100. Yeah. Um, yeah, LCC used to be a place where it was relatively, I think the LCC graphic design course, if you count all the pathways, has got something like 200 people on it now. I mean, what happened to me next was I then started to be an external examiner uh, at uh, Glasgow School of Art, Kingston, mm -hmm. LCC. Um, so that was my next step, if you like. So I moved from going, dropping in to being part of the um, accreditation, if you like. Mm -hmm. But uh, interestingly, my, my first examining job at Glasgow School of Art, um, I was marking. I was 
I wasn't sampling the students, I was marking them. I was an external marker. That was interesting. Um, I enjoyed that actually. Um, but it changed. It started, it soon started to change and I was, and then I became just the person coming in to check that they got their marks right, that, yes. that kind of thing, yeah. which I enjoyed a, a bit less really, if I'm honest. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, it's very interesting that, that design education used to be like a job. It used to be Monday to Friday, uh, nine to five. Mm. And right now, uh, a lot of us all over the world have to cope with very few contact, very, very minimal contact time. Right, yeah. How, how can we instill the necessary skills with this greatly reduced contact time? Or how can we sort of educate properly with this greatly reduced contact time? Yeah, I think that's a good, good question, good challenge. I mean, when I'm in and I'm teaching, I'm, I'm, it's one to, one to one or one to three. And it's, mm. But yeah, I suppose you're right. Um, I'm in a seminar for half an hour with three students, so they're getting 10 minutes. You know, and, and that might be all they got for days. Um, yeah, I mean, the, I suppose the onus is still is now very much on the student, isn't it, to, for them to... Uh, I mean, the truth is the great students will rise to the top anyway, won't they? Um, it's, the, it's the students who need the most help who one fears for, slightly, yes. Yeah. But do you feel that skills can be still cultivated in this short amount of time? Uh, in the transmission from the tutor to the student? Yes, like, yeah. Um, I, I, I doubt it, mm. if I'm honest. I mean, uh, how, it's very, very hard, isn't it? I mean, you see, I look at this, I, I must admit, I look at it in slightly different ways in that I was essentially self-taught. I was on a course where I did technically have a tutor, but I barely saw him. And I think we, you know, I was a guinea pig on a course to do visual art and marketing, and I decided what I did and ran my own projects and kind of just got on with it really. So mm. my experience of design education is very different to most people's. So the complete reverse, if you like, of 250 people mm. arriving for a crit on one day and, you know, juggling with their USB sticks or, you know, the PDF doesn't work, sir, and all that kind of thing. You know, like, um, so mine's very different. I, I suppose I'm mentioning it because I just dealt with it. You know, I just thought this is not an ideal situation. There were four books on graphic design in the library. I just got on with it, you know, and there is part of me that thinks, well, come on guys, just get on with it. You know, it's not rocket science. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot of books now. There's a huge internet to help you, you know, come on, let's go. Um, and my biggest beef actually is, is just trying to get, um, uh, trying to get the art schools to, um, to realize what it is that is actually done out here <laughs> in, in, in my side, if you like, in my world. Mm. Uh, so in the branding world, it's very, very difficult because mm. people just simply don't understand it. You know? yes. um, so do you think that there's the gap between the real world and education, is that sort of getting bigger? I think it might be. I, I, I sense it is, yes, because I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to be that guy who sort of says, Oh, for God's sake, personal projects, what's going on? Because, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of a research or a personal project with, with the best of them. Um, but what, what is really tricky is the, the, the jump out of uh, self-expression, if you like, mm -hmm. into doing a branding project for a, uh, a climate change conference, let's say. I'm just picking an example of something we've just done. Now, that's a big jump. For people and how to deal with that and how to cope with it. Um, we might have people here who, who for two, three years are just at, at sea, really, if they come straight out of college. Um, now, I don't want to, uh, I guess the inference of that is that I'm suggesting that they teach people how to be more realistic. I'm not really, I'm just thinking it might be an idea if, um, that, uh, if design schools were just a bit more together about it. Because Go into most design schools now, and, and if you say, oh, I'll come in and teach a branding module, they go, okay, yeah, great. Well, for, oh, no, 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 we've already done that because we did a logo project last term. And you go, well, no, that's not what I meant. I said a branding project. I didn't say, you know, design your... And there's still one design college, his name will remain nameless, whose branding project is to design their own monogram. Each, each student designs a, a thing for their letterhead, and that's their branding module you know and it's like oh okay you know 
it's part of the reason why I've, I've been writing books and mm -hmm. on, on the branding process and writing, I've recently written a book on how, how to have ideas. I'm it's doing this. Maybe, well, 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 you're very kind. But maybe I'm doing this because I think there's a bit of a gap, you know. Um, I hadn't really thought about it like that, but, you know. But how can we help that reduce, bridge the gap? Like, a pra um, practical point of view in education. Well, I mean, I, I think fairly obviously, the educationists have to ask more people like me to come and help. Mm. You know, but what's interesting is they don't. Um, what happens is they start to become a little cartel. Um, mm. So I've noticed over the last decade or so that the external examiners now tend to be from within education rather than from without, yeah? That's because the educationists understand the process, understand how sampling works, understand that really they're there to check the, where the bands are and to have a nice little jolly mm. and get 400 quid in their pocket. Now, to the practitioners, it has got a little less interesting. Yes, that's fair, but we're not being asked can, anymore, mm. um, it seems to me. I discussed this recently with an educationist and, and she agreed with me that this is a definite thing that's happening. The other thing is that um, I think there's this other thing which is that there's a lot of people who leave college and can't necessarily get any work, so they start teaching. Yeah, this is a syndrome, yeah? So not very busy, I'll just do a day or two at my old college. And then bit by bit, they become a one day or a two day or even a 0.5 or whatever the terminology is. And what you have is this kind of odd syndrome where people who didn't really work much outside of college are now teaching. Well, it used to take in, at least 10 years for a graduate to start teaching. Yeah. Well, that's absolutely not the case anymore. There's a lot of graduates who are going freelance and also teaching. Mm, mm. And, and, my, uh, and so what you get is this kind of self-perpetuation, self if you like. Um, and so, you know, and how would they know, how would someone who's only two years out of college know how to do a huge branding project? They, mm. Because they haven't done one, you know. I mean, okay, they can read one of my books. Yeah, big so deal. But, yeah. Maybe apprenticeships or more apprenticeships? Oh, uh, how to fix this, you mean? Mm, mm. Well, I think they just need, I think that, you know, more senior people need to be asked to come and help. I think it's mm. very simple, actually. Um, but it, I know that doesn't fit with the way that education works at the moment. Why it doesn't fit, I don't know. Um, and yeah, okay, people outside, outside, ed, outside education, as it were, um, are busy and it's tough to find the time. Yeah, yeah. But mm. I don't think it's impossible. That's just one of my, my thoughts, you know. So what would you be looking in, in, in a graduate? The, if a graduate aspired to come and work for you, what, what are the qualities would you be looking at in them or in their work? Um, uh, I don't think my criteria have changed mm -hmm. for 30 years. It's just they have to have fantastic ideas. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. Ideas, ideas, more ideas, you know. Um, two, two good ideas, okay. Four, pretty good. Oh, we've got four. If they've got six great, amazing ideas in their portfolio, they get hired. Mm. Now, the truth is that we very rarely see people with six amazing ideas in their portfolio. And, and when I tell this to students, they look kind of completely stunned because, you know, what do you mean? I've got 12 fabulous projects in my portfolio. I'm, I'm thinking, well, no, you haven't, you know. Is that because design in general has become more about visual and less about the ideas? Is that, is that because- Maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah. We're definitely in a period where it's very much about the style of things. A, yeah. a lot of colleges are actually curating their, their graduates. Uh, yeah. I feel that also very few places are actually taking risks, like allowing complete freedom. They're rather curating yeah. the final shows. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, that's, that's, that's fair. We're actually seeing, uh, it's, a, it's a general theme that we're seeing less ideas-based design and more mm. surface-based design. Yeah, I, I think we've been there for a while, let's mm. be honest. I think that the, um, I don't mean it, when I say ideas based, I don't necessarily mean that I want everyone to dig out a smile in the mind and bash out, you know, kind of mm. what I call sight gags from the late 80s. I don't mean that at all. Mm. I just mean genuine insight and genuine thought rather than just basically reading it's nice that and, and collecting stuff on Pinterest. That is not design. That is, that is collecting. 
and, and finding stuff. Now, graphic designers have always done that, yeah? Graphic designers have always collected and found stuff and, and loved stuff and thought, oh, I want to use that typeface in my next, next project, or I've always loved that color, I want to use that type. I mean, there's, that, that is part of what designers are, you know, that kind of magpie thing where they collect stuff. Yeah. Um, it just seemed uh, for a while to get just a bit intense where, you know, we might have a series of juniors or even a series of freelancers in the studio and they'd all design exactly the same way. And you'd start, I find that a bit of a head scratcher really, you know, and you can't. So you could, okay, I'm talking about London here, but you could almost, it's getting quite tricky now to identify a, what project came from which studio because they all share this kind of, this kind of uh, norm core, slightly undesigned, slightly brutal aesthetic. Um, which is fine, I guess, for some projects. But you know, we, we, I'm, I do, I work in a world where, the, 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 I'm, I'm trying to solve my client's problem, not, not which typeface will I choose problem. You know, <laughs> you know, mine's a very different world. You know, mm -hmm. we, you know, uh, but that, I know that, and I know that we, uh, by definition, I think, if you're going to do the kind of work that Johnson Banks does. And if you're going to try and design things that might last for five, 10, maybe even 15 years, you're not, you're not always going to be on the front page of it's nice that because you are by definition, you're not very groovy really, because you're not, you're not throwing oil at a piece of type and, and spinning it in after effects and then making it into animated gifs. You know, we don't do that every day <laughs> because, you know, because we're trying to work out how to, I don't know, you know, some humanitarian NGO who needs a new flag, that will work, that will have a symbol on it that anyone in any language could understand that they, they could go there to get food and water. You know, ours are much more, you know, a head and heart and real issues than how quickly should my GIF move? <laughs> of course, of course. So you, you're saying that also they need to be able to, to, to be aware of their process, to be able to explain their process. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I, I, I know this sounds a bit clear, but I, I think we're just trying to find people who uh, are, are doing interesting visual and, and verbal work, very important for me, um, to be able to balance the visual and the verbal to understand the branding process, even if they don't really understand it, but they have some awareness of what it means. In our case as well, in my particular case, most of our clients are ethical. And so, you know, we're starting to attract and retain a design um, team who are purpose-driven. They want to come here and they want to do work that will, uh, it may not change the world completely, but certainly we feel like we're helping, you know, rather than, I don't know, just launching a new car or something like that, you know. So we're, you know. So all of those things make my requirements different, of course, you know, and I'm aware of that. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Tell us about the work you're, you're currently doing. Um, oh, okay. Uh, we, uh, we're doing a big project for the UN Climate Conference here in the UK later in the year. Um, we're doing a biodiverse... Oh, hello. You, I left, you left me. Hello. You're still there. Um, we're doing a big project for the, uh, on biodiversity for a big a museum here. We're doing a music academy. When I say doing, we're brand, branding, rebranding. Um, we're also doing the Royal Institute of British Architects. We're doing these very big, um, I suppose, institutional projects at the moment. Mm. At the same time, we're also trying to do more work with startups. We're doing a, a kind of fintech startup. We've been doing a couple of vegan and vegetarian startups. Um, so we're, tr we're, we're trying to kind of broaden slightly because for a while there we were, we were only doing NGOs and I love working for NGOs, um, but it can get a bit, you, you're in a kind of like a corridor really. Um, mm -hmm. and so we've been trying to broaden into education. We did a big project for Cambridge University a couple of years ago that has opened doors for us and we're trying to do more things in philanthropy. So education, philanthropy, um, cultural work, we've always done that. Um, and uh, and now we're, we're starting to do things in the kind of green and climate space, but proper projects, not just kind of diddling about projects, you know. So, yeah, so it's a really interesting mix of stuff. At the moment. But you also mentioned writing earlier. So would you, would you want, for example, the people that are interested to, to have uh, good writing skills from, uh, from the onset? 
Yeah, I think that's a, it would be fantastic, but let's be completely honest. We all know that graphic designers generally don't write. Yeah. Um, in fact, I, sadly, I fear that a lot of the time graphic designers and artists and visually led people have been led that way because they can't write, you know, mm -hmm. because they were a bit shit at history or English <laughs> at school or a bit dyslexic, maybe they went the other way. Um, and so, I mean, the incidence of it, dyslexia, I think, in designers is really high, something like 40%. Yes, it is. I mean, it's really high. Um, so it, it's... Um, I love having designers here who, who like words, but uh, it, I can only, only 50% of the time just to, do I have designers who really get words. The other 50% probably see the words as the bit, as the gray things that go between the pictures. Picture, picture, gray thing. <laughs> um, and so the running gag in the, in the studio is, Michael, can you write some words for me, please? Because so I will effectively be the in-house copywriter. Now, that's not saying that all the designers are like that. And um, I usually have at least one, sometimes two, who are really into words. And I, they're using the words and the pictures to communicate equally, um, which to me is a no-brainer, but you'd be amazed. <laughs> yeah. You'd genuinely be amazed at how few designers see it that way. So what, what would you advise for, for students, graduates, to, to do more of? Uh, in, that, in, that, in that direction. In that area? Oh, in terms of writing, in, in you general, mean? In general, like, what would, you, what would you want them to do more of? Well, I think that a lot of the time, I think the, fi the, the penny is finally dropping with clients, that uh -huh. the words that organizations use and the messages and the way that they are positioned and their brand narrative, I'm using these words deliberately, all of these words are really useful and you can communicate as much with the words that, uh, around the brand as you can with the pictures, okay? That penny has dropped. Um, out there in the brand world, um, it has not dropped in colleges. Um, mm -hmm. And so branding briefs, if they're set, are still about the pictures and the logos and the livery on the aeroplane and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, now, so I think any aspiring brand designer could do really help themselves by reading books on copy, not that there are very many, but you know, studying, studying old advertising books. That's how I got it into it actually the kind of classic advertising period of 60s and 70s, um, both uh, US and UK, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there were some really fabulous examples of how words were integral to the communication. Of course, advertising now has kind of dumped copy as well. <laughs> mm. Interestingly, but that's their problem, not mine. But yes. uh, maybe they'll come back to it. You know. So, I mean, to an aspiring graduate, I would, who wants to do the kind of things that we do, Let's say you wanted to get a job at Johnson Banks, it would be really helpful if you had a sense of the way that words work and the way that words communicate. Um, you only need to do a look at a project like um, Dear World Yours Cambridge, which is this yeah. Cambridge project we've been doing. Now that's a, okay, it's a, it's a pretty good piece of writing, I think. Me and my favorite writer, Nick, Nick, Nick Asprey, we worked on it together and it's just this really rich scene of writing. Mm -hmm. But that's not a one-off from our perspective. That's one of many that use that have writing at the core of the brand mm -hmm. and the writing is as important as as the visual approach mm. fantastic so so i mean what in in terms of that sort of you, you did you did mention some, some points but what would you do in 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 design education differently what would you keep replace or or introduce um, which bit? <laughs> I mean, I would, I, would, I would strongly question some of the, I mean, that's a very big question. Ooh. Okay. Um, one of my favorite courses, I'm not going to name it, is obsessed by, um, uh, with outputs which are basically book and print based. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got to query that. You know, I've got absolutely a problem with people getting into type and learning how to use type. But if the, if the eventual output is a printed thing, you've got to think, well, really? You know, because there is very little printed thing anymore. You know, our world is online. It's moving. It's digital. You know, our, but our brand... They, but how would they improve the typography skills? Because you're saying improve typography skills. How, yeah, how sure. How do to, to do that? 
Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, that, that's an open question, I think, which is, okay, if you're going to teach students how to get into typography and you're not going to give them the book, a book or a short run book as an output, then how do they do it? Yeah, I, I'm, just, I'm just thinking of things which um, I would do better. I would definitely, um, in slightly selfishly, try and encourage a broader understanding of branding. I would definitely um, get digital on the you'd be amazed how many are still not embracing digital. You know, it's quite scary, really, how much stuff is still and your, you know, and you will do a poster and a letterhead and the brochure and you're sort of thinking, you know, oh my God. Um, now, I guess it's understandable, but it's not realistic. Uh, um, and, and there's a whole load of things that are being looked at in design education, which have almost no relevance to the outside world. Now, the good students, it doesn't matter because they can cope. Um, and as we know, there's always 10 or 15% at the top who are brilliant anyway, it doesn't really matter um, on the good courses. But the, I guess the, the bit in the middle, those are the ones I worry about really because mm. they're not really getting um, what they need, I don't think. So you're saying to address the dialogue between digital and analog, to, have to, to, do, to address yeah. it more, intense, yeah. more intensely. Yeah. I think so, yeah, yeah. But th I mean, th those are all things driven by me and my requirements as a, a, as a guy running a company. However, I, I, th there's another side of me that says, that's all very well, Michael, but what about freedom? What about expression? What about just fucking go for it? And I'm a, a big fan of that as well. You know? So I love to see, when students come and see me and they all, their, their entire portfolio is just made up of uh, student briefs set by outside organizations like DNA, and RSA. Okay, it's useful to see one or two, but it, it's not useful to see the whole thing crammed with that because I want to see ideas. I want to see what voice they have. I want to see what they are made of. Um, so um, that's why in a way uh, the approaches of, let's say the Glasgow course and the Kingston course here in the UK, um, I was rather, rather enjoyed that because there was kind of, they were almost letting people, graphic designers be almost, be more like visual communicators and be like viscom slash conceptual art in a way mm -hmm. and then they can always pull that back to practical applications um, we're also seeing students uh, navigate more towards conceptual art since they find that that uh, there's the, the pool of of viscom has a, is a little bit dry and they're looking for inspiration into, into more abstract also yeah. expressions yeah yeah and so i I'm, i know this sounds a bit i i suppose what i'm looking for is people who can do both who can flip from, from viscom kind of conceptual stuff into, okay, how would we make this work in the real world? And just a little bit more knowledge about the, the real world would really help me without killing their love of big ideas. And, and uh, you know, so that's a tough brief. And I know that's hard to deliver that. What about, what about the, the lack of uh, skills? Is it, because, because sometimes there's also an over-reliance on, on the digital. Yeah. What about the lack of, for example, uh, drawing? Uh, it seems yeah. that courses are doing less and less of it. So yeah. How that yeah. impacts on the portfolio? Yeah, I think that, um, well, let's be honest, graphic designers, from my perspective, over the last 30 years, I think, I think less than half of my designers have been able to draw. Mm. Um, I would love, I love it when they can draw. It's really helpful. And, and I think, you're implied in your question there's an implicit link between those people who can draw between those people who have an innate sense of how something looks right on a page people who can i think a couple of the best kind of layout designers who ever worked with me they could draw they had a sense of space on a mm -hmm. page mm -hmm. um, and maybe there is a link there the people who couldn't draw tended to be people who would just clunk things on a page mm. and and go there it is <laughs> Um, I mean, that's a terrible <laughs> generalization, yes. but yeah, yeah. Now, can you, if they were encouraged more to draw, then that might help. I mean, I, uh, I sometimes try and get my designers to draw type, you know, find mm. tracing paper and ask them to draw an idea before they, um, before they start messing about in Illustrator. Um, you know, I still sc use sketchbooks, obviously, and, yeah. but not all my team do. I do try to encourage them to, but... We're trying to sketch things out and we might even if we're really pushed on time we might just have a day where everything is just drawn and scribbled mm. 
you know, let's see the scribble first before we go anywhere near the, the computer. Uh, I have to admit that that's getting tougher and tougher to do because if you're working to increasingly condensed timelines, um, mm -hmm. yeah, there is a pressure to see well, what would it look like? Well, what does that idea look like? How does that scribble turn into actuality? Um, I try to kind of instill in, in my designers the ability to edit, edit with a pencil, not on in, with pixels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that it seems to be very hard to get that idea to really land. It also can be a lot quicker sometimes. Right? Yeah, it yeah, also absolutely. can be a lot quicker to, to edit something uh, by hand than, than, than yeah, the illustration. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh yeah, and I can kind of draw a series of ideas. And, okay, this comes with, I, get, I know this is like boring old white man explains, but, <laughs> you know, I can draw a series of ideas in my sketchbook and then kind of work, realize within half an hour, okay, those two aren't going to work, mm -hmm. but that one might. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that kind of experimentation with a pencil is, it does seem to be a bit lost. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but would you also be looking for that into the, in, in the portfolio? I would love to see that, but gosh, it's been a while. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it would be great, you know, and I still will ask for sketchbooks, but people very rarely bring them to the meetings, you know, so that's, that has been a change. Yeah, yeah. When I first started employing designers, you would look at the work in the big portfolio, and then you would look at the sketchbooks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, what I tend to do is would ask them to bring their kind of portfolio. And if they get through the first round, then I might ask them to bring their personal projects as well. So I'm deliberately trying to see what they've done for college, if you like, but what, what is it that they really love doing as well? And trying to work out what's, you know, what their kind of design machine capabilities are like, but also what really kind of turns them on, you know, whether it's photography or learning a 3D program or I don't know, or yeah, or drawing or painting or uh, all the other things that they do. Now, if everything is all about the portfolio, that is sometimes a bit of a worry, really. Mm, mm. If, or if that's all they can do. Mm. So where, where can I, our audience discover more about you? Um, oh, okay. Uh, well, um, our website, johnsonbags.co.uk, is pretty extensive. Mm. Mm. I think it's got about 50 projects on it. Mm -hmm. it. Hasn't got every project for the last 28 years. That would be exhausting. <laughs> um, in terms of writing, um, this is my most recent book. Now try something weirder. This is about having ideas. Um, and it's deliberately like a little handbook. Um, this, this one is the kind of tome about branding. I wrote another one about problem solving, problem solved up on the shelf there. Those are good ways to get into my kind of ways of thinking, mm -hmm. um, I think, I hope. Um, they're very easy to read, nice big type. Um, and this one especially is deliberately got, is very millennial friendly, picture, headline, 50 words, you know, <laughs> that's it, you know, and I turn the page, do another one, you know, so it's like, it's like a series of Instagram posts, basically. Um, <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. <laughs> so I, and, and there's a lot of, and so our uh, Instagram account is kind of rolling, seems to be getting up to speed. So, mm. Yeah. Mm. Super, super. Any, any last advice you'd like to leave us with? Uh, who, who for? It's up to you. you okay, yeah. Or, or you could choose the stakeholders. Or you could say. Okay. You yes. I, I mean, you can see I do do a lot of messaging these days. I'm immediately analysing your target audience. Um, yes. Uh, well, I think that. I mean, to all the if there's a really great student out there looking at this, then remember you just need to have six fantastic projects in your portfolio. It's as simple as that, really. But but you have to do six. You know. It can't be like, you know, because the, the, problem, the problem that I have, if I see two great bits of work and the rest is filler, then I'm immediately suspicious, okay? Mm. I'm immediately thinking, okay, this was a group project or they had a great day or they, they got the idea from someone else. So mm. that's why I'm looking for breadth of skills and ideas. Um, mm. So that's what I'm looking for from students, for, from design colleges. I think that, I don't know, but I sense a kind of reticence to ask the outside world, the, the working designers, back in. And I don't know why this is the case. I, I think that education, I sense that education has got quite insular at the moment. And it is full of people who are, are in education or who were in education or, are, like I say, were, have got their toe in and out of education. And 
they're just kind of perpetuating this little world really and and so i guess it becomes uncomfortable to to email someone like me and say hi hey michael how about it because you'd be amazed i don't get that many advances anymore maybe because people are thinking oh well michael's never gonna reply or he's not gonna help um we might be able to help. We have lots of colleges that come to us, to this room here, actually, and we do lots of outreach, as it were. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure other design studios and design firms would do that. I just sense a bit of reticence, if you like. But we don't want to get the, the real world involved in our world, which I think is a bit naive, if mm -hmm. I'm honest. Um, so, so the general of us would connect more to the real to the real world. I, I think so. Yeah, I sense that there used to be more connectivity than there is now, and I don't really know why that is. Um, it's the paradox, and now I've written so several books, I seem to have less contact with the people I've written the books for, <laughs> which is weird, really. Um, but you know, um, um, I mean. I mean, the, my, my, another message I suppose to the design business is that I, I think the, the design business in general has got to really wise up to the fact that it needs to be doing more good. It needs to be, it can't just talk about being purpose driven to its clients and not be purpose driven itself. Yeah. You can't tell your client to be green and then go and do an off, go off and do an ad for a car. You can't, you know, do some groovy uh, pro bono cultural stuff. I don't know, for a music organization and then, you know, work for an airline. It, 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 this, this, um, it's an oxymoron, you know, and, and it's like the design world is just ignoring it. You're you talking know? about, yeah, the CSR, doing real CSR. So yeah, well, not just CSR, I mean, actually yes. doing it, yes. not just doing it for, for exactly. the, a little bit of it. Yeah, exactly. you know, I mean, why, I do get really annoyed about it. I have to be careful what I say here, but, you know, I don't really care about the animation used in a Nike ad. I really don't. I'm really not that bothered about selling cars or trainers or fizzy mm. drinks mm. Um, or new sweaters or uh, nicer jeans. I'm really not, you know, unless the jeans are sustainable, unless the leggings are made from recycled plastic. Okay, then I'm interested. And I, 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 I know there's a whole cohort of designers out there who feel that way, this way, but they're stuck in companies run by people who are just taking the dollars, yeah? Who are just going, yeah, yeah, we can never be like Johnson Banks, you know? They're the, you know, they're lucky, you know? It's like, well, it's bollocks, really, you know? All you have to do is tell people this is what you do and then just get on with it, you know? Um, and it's, it is very frustrating, really, <laughs> you know? But, and I think, I don't think the design business helps itself that work much really, because what it does is it tends to just celebrate stuff, um, like you were saying earlier, it celebrates the kind of pretty stuff and, and the surface stuff. Um, and I keep thinking, well, how did that happen? You know, okay, you know, okay, a donut company rebranded, big fucking deal. You know, I'm really not that bothered and donuts are killing people, yeah. you know. You know, uh, Twitter is full of an ad for a burger company at the moment. Okay, they're nice, nice photographs of a burger. It's a burger. You know, you know, it, why are we talking about photographs of a burger? You know, um, and so I find this very frustrating. Um, sorry, yeah, I did no, warn you. Is, I, no, please, yeah, please. I warned you about the rant before it oh, came. You know. But, you know, so eventually the world is going to wake up. But I think the graphic, the design business is, is, sort of got its head in the sand about this at the moment. And you mentioned CSR. They're sort of treating the, um, uh, the occasional charity or, or cultural Boxing, project as, yeah. as their CSR, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, we've done some good. Yeah. Now let's go back to the 80% mm -hmm. that isn't good, but we don't tell anybody about, but pays the bills, you know. Mm. It's like, hmm, you know, really? Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Brilliant. Well, that, that, was, that was very useful. Thank you so much. Okay, my pleasure. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to also seeing you in our conference in this November. In yes, if I can make it, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, super. All Thanks right. so much. Great. Thanks very much. All right.